Um, so we have a session with Kyle Walker, who'll be talking about his kind of career within the media and broadcasting um, kind of industry. So Kyle and Mark, if you're able to pop your cameras and mics on. <laughs> Hi, both. Thank you so much for joining me today. So I'll start to share the screen and I know that Mark has got quite a few questions for you to go through today. Um, if anyone does have any kind of questions surrounding um, Kyle's career, then please pop them in the chat, but we'll get started um, and to, to talk about kind of your your future and, and your, your previous career. Well, thank you. Yeah. Looking forward to it. Perfect. Uh, so, Mark, you should have access to, to go through the slides, hopefully. It's, it's always one of these things when it's kind of virtual is trying to pass on the slides. Are you okay with those, Mark? Uh, am I controlling the screen? Let's oh, I think I am. Yes, wonderful. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> it's not Zoom, it's Microsoft Teams. Anyway, uh, Kyle, thanks so much for joining us. We're we're very lucky to have uh, to have someone like you come in and speak to us, who is from Manchester as well, um, and is having such a, a fantastic career at the moment. So I can't wait to kind of pick your brains, and I'm sure you'll have loads of amazing advice for. For our, our students so um yeah thanks for thanks thanks for being here with us no it's um, my pleasure i'm looking forward to it so uh do you want i mean it, it's easy to find out what you do just a quick google uh <laughs> just a quick google of your name and it doesn't come up with many other other options does it so um yeah t tell us a little bit about uh what you're where you're at at the moment and kind of what your what your kind of uh main roles are right now yeah, so welcome everyone. Hello. It's weird that I can't see you all, but if you can see me, it's nice to see you all. Uh, you do say that if you Google my name, it comes up with a lot of the stuff I do. It comes up with the footballer. Um, so everyone that's joined that thinks, oh no, this isn't the footballer. I'm sorry. I'm sorry for disappointing you. It's the other one. That's what normally gets attached to the end of my name. Uh, but yeah, my name's Kyle Walker. I'm from Manchester, as was said there. I'm from Fallowfield, grew up in Manchester, and I work for the BBC, Sky Sports, as you can see, as well as Manchester City, as well as lots of other people as well. Um, I'm a presenter slash broadcaster slash I talk for a living. Um, yeah, so that's kind of what I do, uh, mainly around football, um, but also bridging out into other sports and then into lots of different things like music and things that interest me as well. There's lots of kind of exciting roles and exciting companies that, that, that you work for. Um, I'm going to put you on the spot. Are, are any of them kind of like your, your favourite? What do you, which, of those <laughs> do you, which of those do you enjoy the most? Um, I do love all the TV stuff that I do. Um, Sky Sports is so exciting, mainly because, well, I mean, if I'm honest, anything on TV... There was a period of one weekend where I'd worked on, um, I'd worked on match of the day, football focus, and these were all these programs that I've watched as a kid, Five Live as well. Literally, there was pre-recorded stuff that was going out over this one weekend, and it was so strange because my granddad was ringing me saying, "I've listened to you on the radio, I've watched you on the TV, and these are programs we used to watch together." So it's just so exciting to be able to be involved in programs like that. I used to wake up on a Sunday morning as a kid. I didn't stay up late enough to watch Match of the Day at night, so I was waking up on a Sunday morning, and here I am, X amount of years later featuring on these programs so yeah I love all the tv stuff because it makes me it makes me feel proud of myself I'm not going to lie because of watching them as a kid and now being on them and how often do you kind of uh, watch yourself back or listen to yourself back to kind of kind of see how you've done is that part of the process for you or do you prefer to just kind of like box it out of the way after you've done it um I'm very comfortable watching myself um, back. I think that's because of my drama school training. So I'm sure we'll get into that in a bit, but I actually went to drama school, so I trained as an actor. So we were constantly watching ourselves back on camera because my drama school focused on acting for camera as well. So there was a lot of sitting and watching myself back. For a lot of people, they hear their own voice or they see their own face and they go, I look like that. Wait, I sound like that. Um, and you, you get a bit thrown off, but I think it's part of it because actually you have to critique yourself you have to be able to take feedback and you have to watch yourself and go why did I do that why did I ask that question that way why did my voice sound that way when I was speaking like that and it's always things that you can improve on so I think that it's definitely something that is worth doing even though for some people they hate it and I understand it but you just have to get over that because how are you going to get better if you can't watch yourself back Good stuff. So, you're, I mean, now you're a broadcast journalist and presenter. You mentioned there you went to, to acting school. At, at what stage did you kind of think that working in football, 
journalism or broadcasting was something that you you might like to do um because was acting kind of what you what you thought you wanted to do and you fell into the the broadcasting side or was that always on your mind no, I fell into the broadcasting side completely. So I, I've always been involved in sport. I've always played sport. I've always wanted to be involved in sport in somehow. And I actually thought I was going to be a PE teacher. That's what I thought I wanted to train as to continue to do something within sport. But I was also doing um, lots of stuff at contact theatre. So I was doing lots of uh, stuff like that. And it got to that awkward stage in year nine where I had to pick my options. And drama and sport were in the same box. You could only pick one from a certain box. So I was like, what do I do? I ended up going with sport, continued on that. But I was doing the acting outside. Very quickly realised it was something that I wanted to do when I got to college and then went to drama school. And we're going to get onto it later because I know some of the slides that are in there. But I quickly realized that the academic side of stuff wasn't what I needed to focus on. It was more the practical side of things. So then I get into drama school. I do three years there and um, I came out of drama school. And it's quite funny because I was working as an actor, I was doing TV, theater, um, adverts as well. And then I got this opportunity to work on some presenting stuff. The people knew I was a Manchester City fan. They asked me to come in and literally from that one opportunity, it snowballed and I started to get more and more stuff. Um, and then I started to work with Manchester City. And then all of a sudden I was working with the BBC. I was working with Sky Sports. I was working with all of these people. And it's funny when people say you're a broadcast journalist or you do journalism and I'm like, I've not got a degree in that. So I, I don't know how I've managed that. But I guess for me, I've learned on the job. I've learned from working within the BBC and getting all of that experience. Nice. I think I, I always say that as well to the students is that, you know, obviously with, they're taught by people who, use, who, are, who are journalists as well. But the in-classroom experience is super, super valuable. But, you know, getting those work experience placements uh, and getting that on the job, hands-on experience that is the most valuable thing that you can do in, in, in terms of improving yourself, I think. Would you go along with that? Definitely, uh, especially for, for me, being out there, being on the job. I joined drama school. We had a lot of training with camera stuff. And we actually did a presenting segment, and that was just creating stuff, putting together a, a show reel, working with presenters who were already working and then putting stuff out there and just being aware of the camera, being aware of certain things really helped me. And you get all of that experience out there on the job. When I'm at football games, interviewing people, when I'm around and about, you start to pick up little things, little tricks. You start to pick up all of the technical, the technical side of things as well, about microphones, about cameras, about all the different wires that go into all the different places you start to pick all of that up and it's great sitting in a classroom. It's great talking about these things, but until you do it, until you mess up, until you make mistakes, until you learn from those things, that's when you really get the, the valuable experience in my opinion. Absolutely. And that's, I mean, that's something we really like to do at, at UA92 as well as, you know, give people practical hands-on experience, you know, with equipment, producing content. And then also we're constantly trying to link them with organizations and media organizations, particularly kind of around, around Manchester and the Northwest as well. So they can kind of further those opportunities because that, that experience, that practical hands-on experience is just, is, is just so valuable. You mentioned before about, um, kind of that that one moment that kind of brought you in the direction can you just tell us a little bit more about how you were kind of discovered if you like and um that kind of defining moment for you and that that big break that you had yeah so there's probably been quite a few the first one was literally got a message and they the producers asked me to come in into for a meeting they asked me to come and talk about Manchester City I did that didn't think anything was going to come of it but then one of those producers moved to start working with Manchester City and there was an opportunity for me to go in there as a City fan and it's actually quite funny because uh, Michael Russell who's the head of Man of City TV has just messaged me <laughs> about five minutes ago about something completely different I've not heard from him in a while but he rang me and he said Kyle can you come and do this work and I said Michael I can't do it I'm busy he said Kyle come and do this video I said Mike, honestly, if I could, I would. He said, Kyle, make sure whatever it is that you're doing, try and move it, come and do this video. 
And that is something I quickly realised is you have to be flexible. You have to try and be adaptable when you can be. I managed to sort it out. I had the awkward conversations with the other people I was working with. I said, is there any chance I could come in later? They said, yeah, of course, no worries at all. And most of the time you find that people will try and help you wherever they can. So I went in, I did this video, got into this taxi, having no idea. It was just as a City fan. And Pep Guardiola, the Manchester City manager, was in there. He was in the taxi. Now, in the video... I've got a different hair. I've got a high top. So my, my hair's quite higher. I get into this taxi and they say, watch your hair on the cameras, put your seatbelt on. So I get into the taxi, watch my hair on the cameras, put my seatbelt on. Now I think that Chappie, the kit man's going to be in there. So I see him in the front seat. I turn and Pep Guardiola is in the other seat. And there's a, a moment of realization when I breathe and I go, just be cool, Kyle, just speak to him. And I just chatted to him for 15 minutes. Two weeks later, my acting agent at the time got a phone call, could Kyle come and work with us? Yeah, of course. Started doing some, hosting some events for them. They just liked what I brought um, to that conversation. And then again, it snowballed. There was another moment where I got a phone call from some of the producers at Lad Bible. And they asked me, they said, can you come and meet us on Monday in London? Oh, I've got to go all the way down to London for a meeting. That's fine. I've been doing that for a while. Jump on the train, I get there. And the first thing they say is, are you free on Saturday to interview Tiger Woods? Of course I am. Of course I'm free on Saturday to interview Tiger Woods. So that week I go down, I interview Tiger Woods, that video drops. And then, wow, it, it then again, it gets them bigger and bigger. And it was just about those opportunities that I got, making the most of them, being myself. And those were the kind of moments I look back on. And I think, wow, if I wouldn't have done that, if I would have said to Michael Russell, I can't do it. I'm sorry. That's it. End of. I wouldn't, I genuinely would not be here right now speaking to you. And that's kind of the moments I look back on with a smile. I was just thinking when you're saying it, like just imagine if you'd said no and you didn't get the opportunity to like meet Pep and to, to interview Pep. What an incredible opportunity to have. Um, that's like one thing that I think is a great lesson for people to learn as well um, is saying yes to things. Is that kind of something that you've, you've learned? Can you ever say yes to too many things? Um, <laughs> um, yes, you can. You, you definitely can. I am very guilty of saying yes to too many things. Um, but I also enjoy it. It's quite funny, actually. One of my friends messaged me yesterday. We were chatting and they said, I feel sorry for you working all the time. And I said, what, what do you mean? I said, I love it. 18 hour days, give them to me because I love what I do. How many people can say that they love what they do? They get paid for something that they enjoy. You get to do some incredible work. You get to chat to some incredible people as well. And you enjoy it. After a long, hard day, you get into bed and you've got a smile on your face because you enjoy what you do. I thrive off that. And it's quite funny because on the slides right there, it says, what were you like at school? Well, I used to get told off for of talking. Now I do it for a living. That's in my Instagram bio. It's in my Twitter bio right now. All of my teachers that I've spoke to since school, it's one of the first things that I talk about. I used to get told off so much for talking in school. And now it's what I do for a living. And I just sit back and I laugh at that because if they would have shut me down, if they would have told me to stop, which they did, but if they would have forced me to stop, I wouldn't have developed all of these skills right now. And going back to the question about saying yes to too many things. Yeah, you can do, but as long as you're enjoying it, as long as your diary can be managed in some capacity, then I don't think you can say yes to too many things, but you've got to understand about saying yes to the right things as well. Good stuff and you're so true it's so true there about like you know doing something that you're passionate about and how that that just makes a difference and you're happy to do long hours you're happy to travel uh, I still get the same buzz whenever I cover a football match as I did when I first started like I absolutely love it um, and I think it's just so important to try and find something that you, you you're passionate about and chase that down and persevere with it how many have you had many kind of knockbacks uh, or like particular challenges um, along the way that you kind of think about and they think actually helps you kind of grow as a person? Um, there's always setbacks. There's always no. There's always people getting other work over you. There's always you being told no to an opportunity. That happens. I feel like I got used to that quite quickly from working in the acting industry because you go to auditions every day. You're traveling. You'll go two and a half hours. You go all the way to London on the train for a five-minute audition. And then they'll say no. And you think, oh, right, next one, next one. And yeah, that can uh, affect you. But 
what I found when I moved into presenting was the work was coming to me. That was one of the things where I didn't think this was ever going to be a career when I first started. It wasn't until I was busier with presenting than acting that I thought, wow, the work's coming to me. I'm turning down work right now. But then even when you've got all of the work coming into you, you've got some incredible opportunities, it's very easy to want more. I'm very guilty of wanting more. It's why I love to work. It's because I want to be doing as much as possible. I want to show people what I can do. So I'm very guilty of that. And that can have a negative effect on you at times. Also looking at what other people can do. That can be a knockback because you always want to do something. You could be doing something incredible. They could be looking at you and going, oh, I wish I was doing what Kyle's doing. And you're looking at them going, well, I wish I was doing uh, what you're doing. But I try and remain as positive as possible. If I'm being extremely honest, there was a bit of a knockback a few weeks ago. Um, I was doing some work with Sky Sports all um, throughout January. Um, so I was working on their transfer show, um, Good Morning Transfers, throughout the entirety of January. Every single week I was on there. And the Scottish Sun, there was a reporter from there who wrote an article about the work after it was all done. And he labelled everyone that was involved in it um, a bunch of box tickers. I can't remember what he actually said. And that was a massive knockback, actually. That was probably the biggest time, the first time in my career, I get negative stuff every single day, especially having my name on Twitter. I love it. I don't mind it. I don't interact with it that often. I just laugh at people. Um, but this one really actually hurt me because... You work so hard, you grind, you work, you travel, you do everything to get out there. You get this incredible opportunity with Sky Sports News. Wow. And then someone says it's because of the colour of your skin. That that hurt. That was very frustrating because they don't know the work that goes in behind the scenes. They don't know the amount of stuff I do that people don't even see. And then someone will just say, yeah, you only got that because you're you're mixed race or you're black. And that, that was very frustrating. So, yeah, that was a knockback, but then we bounce back and we go again. Uh, you mentioned that a little bit there about social media and obviously sometimes you're having to deal with tweets directed at uh, the wrong way. It's supposed to be directed yeah. at the public <laughs> one. But um, I think like, you know, the use of social media and also like the abuse that broadcasters get on social media. We saw at the weekend, Sonia McLaughlin, the, yeah. you know, the BBC Sport, uh, BBC Rugby uh, presenter getting a lot of abuse on Twitter. And she opened up and was very honest about how it kind of made her feel. Um, Again, like how how do you deal with that when it's kind of on a daily or on a regular basis? How do you develop that thick skin? And do you, do you think we should have to develop that thick skin as journalists, or do you think there needs to be something kind of done about that? Um, so I understand that if you put something out there onto the internet, whether it's um, on Sky Sports, whether it's a video that goes out on your own personal socials, that you're putting something out onto the internet so people can have an opinion on it. I have opinion on lots of stuff that gets put out there. So I understand that that's part and parcel with the job. However, let's have a conversation. I, um, I put up a tweet the other day about Manchester United. I talk about Manchester United, not as much as I talk about Manchester City, but quite a lot, just like I talk about Liverpool, just like I talk about lots of different things because it's my job. But people take it as a personal attack and you can't have a conversation with someone. So when you put something out there or you don't even put something out there, you're on TV, people feel like they can have an opinion on you. And what we saw there with Sonia at the weekend was you can criticise the way that she asked the questions if you have an opinion on that. Doesn't mean that your, your criticism is valid. Doesn't mean that your opinion is valid. Too many people believe that their opinions mean something. They don't. You don't work within this industry. So what you're thinking, you, you're entitled to that opinion. It doesn't hold any value or weight in my opinion. But doesn't mean that it doesn't hurt when somebody's criticizing you. You can have a thousand good comments about your piece that you've put out into the internet, into the world of football but it's the one negative comment that you're going to see from someone sat behind a keyboard. Instead of constructive criticism, it's always about something that, that you didn't even think of or something that doesn't even matter. So that can be frustrating, but I'm learning more and more, still slip into it, just ignore it. There's no point engaging within it because once you engage in it, that's then out there as well. You're, you're, you're shining light onto it. Nine times out of 10, if somebody tweets me, no one's going to see it because no one's searching my mentions. But if I then retweet it, if I engage, the people that follow me are then going to see it as well. 
yeah, it's a, it's a really good point. And it's also a great point that no matter how good the work is that you do, you, it always just niggles at you if someone is having a pop at you <laughs> about what you've done. Like people can say lots of nice things to you, but you'll always kind of try and you'll always probably remember the ones that, when yeah. people are negative <laughs> to you. Yeah, it's, uh, it's very easy to do so. And that's why I, he I heard someone say something once, don't take the positive comments to heart and don't take the negative comments to heart. Even if you focus too hard on the positive comments, that will affect you as well. Because when you do see the negative comments, that's when it, it really hits you because you said, well, everyone else is saying that it's good. Why, why are you saying that it's bad? So I just take the positive stuff. Yeah, it's great. Thank you for that. But I love constructive criticism. How can I improve? The positive things aren't going to really help me improve. The negative things aren't going to help me improve. Where's the constructive criticism? How is that going to going to help me improve? And I always remember, do I care about this person's opinion? Sounds harsh, but if it's my editor at BBC Radio Manchester... Yeah, I care about her opinion because she's the one who employs me, essentially. She's the one that matters, that we can have a conversation and can help me improve. Do I care about someone that's listening, that's just telling me that, that I, I'm bad at my job? Well, who are you to tell me that I'm bad at my job? So I always try to remember that. Nice prepping our students nicely there for the feedback process as well at university where we, you know, oh. we're, we're all about constructive. It's all about constructive and trying to, you know, help people improve. It's massive. And that's what, again, drama school did help me. The feedback we had every five weeks, we'd work on a project. Then we'd have uh, one week where we showed the project back and then we'd have feedback week, we called it. So you had the project and then you had a day of like feedback from all of your tutors, everyone. And it was con constantly about improving. And it's about how can I improve? And it's very easy to take that, that feedback to heart. Don't. I mean, if you agree with it, you agree with it, even from your tutors. And I will say this doesn't always mean they are right, but always listen to it. See how you can improve, have the conversations. I was hot on it and my teachers didn't like it at school, even high school. Talk to me like I'm an adult. If I've done something wrong, let's have a conversation. Now, when you're 13, 14, an adult, a teacher doesn't, they don't like that. But I was always like, OK, how do I improve? talk to me like I'm an adult. If I've misbehaved, let's have that conversation. And I think that's how you learn is actually the constructive criticism and being able to take it because it's very easy to go, well, no, I, do, I disagree with you. Put your ego to the side and listen. And I think that's a great learning experience I've had from not doing that. <laughs> that's awesome advice. Really, really awesome advice. And yeah, you know, as I said, like the feedback process at university, we're always just trying to help, help people improve and we'll be honest. Uh, but it's all about, you know, like pushing people forward and, and making them the best, best that they can be. Um, one of the things I just noticed on th this slide is about kind of work experience. But one thing I wanted to kind of touch on a little bit, I think, is is networking and what people can do. Um, you think at the stage while they're at university or even like thinking about coming to university, how can you kind of build up that network of contacts for when you're starting from scratch? And can you remember what that was like? It was a long time ago when you were starting from scratch. But can you yeah. remember what it was like? Um, I think that I've always been very lucky that I, I like talking to people. So I don't see it as networking. I just have conversations. It's always that awkward thing when people call it networking that you want something from someone or they want something from you. And very quickly, I realized, let's just forget about that. Let's have a conversation. Um, a lot of the times where... So, so there was a time a few years ago, I was invited to the NFL when it was in um, London. So it was at Wembley. And I was chatting to um, some of the people that were there and I got chatting to this one guy and I said, you look familiar. And he said, six years ago, yeah, we had a meeting and we had a networking kind of thing. He worked at Nike. I did a job in 2012. I was in London for the Olympics doing some other work and I ended up hosting this football tournament um, for Nike. I just went in and had a conversation with him. We had a mutual friend. My friend knew that he needed someone. Six years down the line, he remembered that one conversation that was seen to be networking, but we just had a conversation and he remembered that. And I think that's super important is it can be awkward. You might feel awkward, but what's the point in feeling awkward? It's a made up emotion, in my opinion. 
you put it to the side and just have a conversation and show who you are. And when we've gone onto this career path right now, I think networking's always been a part of it because I had a year out after college. I wanted to go to drama school. I didn't get into the drama schools that I wanted. So I thought I'm going to take this year out. I'm going to work and then I'm going to try and get out there. So for me in that industry, I was going to the theater. I was meeting people. I was meeting directors. I was having a coffee with people. I was 19 years old. I wasn't drinking coffee, but I was still going out there and actually just emailing people and saying, can we meet and can we chat? Doesn't have to mean anything doesn't have to go anywhere but I just want to talk to you I want to pick your brains about things we didn't have zoom back then this was still the days of um what what did we have so we had Facebook so I was messaging people on Facebook I mean I bet other people that are on this chat right now probably don't even use Facebook anymore Twitter was there but wasn't really using it for networking I was using it to talk about football and music that was really it um but there's so many more opportunities right now for you. Um, and then I went to drama school. I got into acting and throughout was always meeting people. And I've got a saying that I have that I won't actually say the words here because it, it's got a swear word in it. Um, but it's don't be a not very nice person. Um, and I've had that kind of installed in me from being 18, 19, um, because when you meet people and they're not very nice, you remember it for a very long time. There are people that I still know of people that I met when I was 18, 19, that I wouldn't want to work with now, 10 years later, because of the way that they treated me or the way that they were back then. So I think going back to the original question about around networking, get out there, message people. The amount of messages I get on Instagram every single day from young people asking me to listen to their podcast, asking me to chat to me, send them. I, I'm not going to ignore you. If I can't do it, I'll be honest with you. But nine times out of 10, what's 10 minutes out of my day to chat to someone? Um, and what's the worst that can happen? They can say no. What does, what does it matter if they do? That, that, that's literally like the saying that I always use with students as well is what's the worst that could happen they'll say no that, that is that is the you know that is the worst thing that's going to happen so I think that's really really again fantastic uh, fantastic advice and I think it's important for people to remember as well that actually you know the majority of people who work in this industry work in media work in journalism they are nice people and they probably <laughs> if, if they have the time they will respond to you and they'll want to help you you know it's really not it's a nice feeling when you're experienced in your job and someone comes and asks you for advice and people love giving advice and love being asked to ask for it. And if people have the time, they will they will offer you their advice. And it's it's awesome, Carl, that you you know you do do that and you do take the time to to respond to people and and like give them advice because I, I do think a lot of people are like that. But don't feel like don't feel too hard done by a negative if people don't necessarily always come back to you because people are busy. But most people will want to help you. I think. Yeah, 100%. And as you said, a lot of people are nice. And it's very easy to forget when you're having a look on your screen, when you're on Instagram and you're looking at someone's profile, it's very easy to look at them and go, oh, wow, they're doing incredible. But they're human beings. Like at the end of the day, we're all just people. We're all going through a pandemic right now. We know, all know how hard it is. And we all are going through our own struggles. Everyone's doing that. So why can't you message another human being? Why can't you speak to them? Because at the end of the day, as we said, all they can do is say no. But if they say yes, amazing, incredible. Now, don't bombard them. Um, I think I learned that very, uh, very, very young that, that if someone, if you email someone, leave it a few days, let it breathe. Don't email them every day. Don't message them every day because nine times out of 10, they will get back to you. They're just a bit busy right now. But I understand as well how hard that can be when you just want an answer to a question, when you just want to hear from someone and you feel like they're ignoring you. It's not the case. They're just busy with something and you've just got to remember that and you've just got to go, okay, I'm going to speak to somebody else. I'm going to ask somebody else and people will get back to you. Just give them time. Good stuff. Um, we've obviously, we've talked about most of the points there. The one we haven't kind of touched on much yet is the future. So I wondered if you could tell us a little bit about anything that is one potentially in the pipeline for you and two I'd like to know how much how often you're kind of thinking about the future how much you're living living in the moment because you're having such a great time doing the stuff you're doing but are you are you thinking about planning and do you have like goals still that you're looking to achieve kind of going forward oh 100 percent. I set so many different goals for myself and 
it can be tough at times because you set a goal and then you achieve it. Because there have been things that I've done. So working with match of the day, working with football focus, and then you do that. And then you go, all right, so how do I sustain that? I've not done much with football focus this season. So part of me is going, well, I've achieved this goal, but now how do I keep hold of the goal? How do I stay there? And then I just start to think it's not meant to be for this season. I'm not doing as much with them. So set other goals, do other things. Um, and I'm very guilty of not living in the moment. I've done some incredible things I've, I've been working throughout the entirety of lockdown I've not stopped it's great but then I think back to before lockdown and the amount of traveling I was doing with work all the amazing things I get Instagram memories every single day having a look at them and going I can't even remember being there I can't remember doing that and it is a shame because I'm always thinking about, right, I've got to do this now, got to give it my all, and then tomorrow I'm moving on to something else. And I try and tell myself just to relax a little bit. There's no point worrying about stuff. But then I remember we're in a pandemic. Then I remember I might not have any work. Then I remember I've got bills to pay. I'm freelance and I might not have any, um, I might not have any work next week. Who knows how things could change and how things could um, pan out. But yeah, there's always goals that have been set Talking about the future, there's been a job that I've been chasing down for the past three years uh, with Sky Sports. I've wanted to do it. I don't know how I was going to do it. And this month I'm actually doing it, which is very exciting. Um, and then the pressure comes because you go, oh, right, I've wanted this for so long. Now I've got to look good. Now I've got to be good. Um, but that'll be coming the end of March. I'm going to be live on Sky Sports. It's the 23rd, 24th. No, 23rd, yeah, 23rd, 24th and 26th um, on Sky Sports working on the E-Premier League. I don't even know if I can talk about it. Anyway, it's <laughs> happening. Okay, so you guys all know about it now. Um, but yes, yeah, so yeah, you know, there's constant <laughs> things that I want to be doing, constant things that I want to be moving on to. And what I love about this industry is I could literally get a phone call right now from my agent, from someone. Last week, what day is it? Tuesday. So last... Thursday or Wednesday, I got an Instagram DM from someone and I ended up knowing that we'd worked together before on something different, but on separate shoots, but part of the same project. And then by the Friday, I was interviewing Ilke Gundawan for Adidas. That was just an Instagram DM that came out of nowhere. He'd seen my work and within 24 hours, I was doing this another job. Things can change at the drop of a hat and I absolutely love it. Now you've been, we've been through. You've you've chatted about a couple of these. I can see the Tiger Woods in, in interview there. But do you want to take us through some of these these photos and the, the moments <laughs> the moments that they kind of represent for you? Yeah. So the Tiger Woods one still, I always remember just being there. We're in the middle of Wembley, and this has happened from the Monday to the Saturday. So on the Friday night, I've been taken to London on the train. I'm in a hotel. I'm there early um, Saturday morning and there's this massive Nike commercial happening. We're all obviously dressed in Nike right there. So that's all happening. And that actually came about because um, Josh Denzel, who is a presenter um, who I've worked with quite a lot now, um, he'd gone into Love Island, but he was actually Sport Bible's presenter. So he was working before it. So he'd gone into Love Island. Again, that had happened. They called me. I said, yes, I could do it. I find myself in the middle of Wembley, the entrance is the, the tunnel with Tiger Woods. And again, it's one of those moments where until he's walking towards you and you go, that is Tiger Woods. There's only a handful of athletes that you can look at and you go, they define a sport. Michael Jordan, Muhammad Ali, Cristiano Ronaldo, Lionel Messi, Tiger Woods. There are a few of us, Serena Williams, Roger Federer. And there are a few others that, that you can name as well that define a sport. And Tiger Woods, yeah, he, he is one of those. And that was a, a crazy day because you just kind of film it. You do your 15, 20 minutes with him. And you go, I've just filmed with Tiger Woods. Let me get the picture for Instagram. Took it up there. And then you get people feeding back going, this is incredible. And, and yeah, it was a, a bit of a crazy day. Um, but it was a beautiful day in Wembley. Next up, Sergio Aguero. Um, this was in London in this abandoned power plant it used to be, but Puma had taken it over for this massive event. And I was actually just doing some work there. 
and it was away from Manchester City, even though we'd worked together at City. And um, yeah, I just got a chance to interview him and we just had some fun. Um, chatting and it's quite funny because I did um, some work with Man City last week that I'm actually not allowed to talk about but Sergio popped up uh, he wasn't he wasn't involved in the work but he just popped up and he was having a laugh and a joke with me via Zoom as everything is right now but I look at memories like that and I think that's Sergio Aguero like that that is just an incredible moment of someone that again he defines a sport is the highest scoring foreign import into the Premier League. Manchester City's all-time leading goal scorer provided us the moment of winning the Premier League for the first time. And here I am just, just with him. It's incredible. Um, and yeah, it's just, uh, you can see the smile on my face right there. Uh, next in the middle uh, is me and Kyle Walker. Now, this is actually my Twitter picture. This is probably why I get a lot of stick. Even though in my bio, it says the Kyle Walker on the left. I make it very clear. People don't read bios. But um, I was doing some work for City and um, each year I've actually been lucky enough to be on the parade buses. So there's a few that go through Manchester and I was um, involved in them doing some work filming behind the scenes. So I'm on the side of the stage and we've been told by the project manager you're not allowed on this stage. You can stand on the side of it. Do not go past this tape right here that's fine. I don't want to, but there's a hundred thousand Manchester city fans in that picture, obviously all along the street, all the way down Dean's gate. And it was just incredible going through all of Manchester. And then I'm on the side of the stage and the kit man, uh, Michael uh, Cliffy, he, he pushes me on stage. He says, Kyle, you're not missing out this opportunity. Kyle's there. And he just chucks the FA cup into my hands he says, you need a picture. So Kyle's like, yeah, come on, we'll get a picture. The, the project manager, the stage manager, I should say, is there. She goes, yeah, just go on, go on, take your opportunity, do it. And I get this picture. And um, again, I'm just a kid from Fallowfield who used to, I grew up with the Kipax in my, my from my bedroom window. I could see it. My granddad, uh, all my uncles, my cousins, my brothers all support Manchester City. And here I am on the stage at the parade. It's one of those moments where I'll just sit back and look at that picture and go, wow, what an incredible memory it was. And yeah, it, it makes me smile. It just makes me sm smile because I've not had a hard life at all. I've not gone through some of the hardships of people from my area that have gone through them. But coming from Fallowfield, you never expect that you're going to be doing these things. You never expect that you're going to be on TV. And it moves me on nicely to that, that picture on the right enjoying the sunshine, um, working for Five Live. I was working outside the Etihad, interviewing fans, chatting to them, creating content. And every single week I got sent around the country to different grounds when we were allowed and when fans were there, as you could see, to chat to them. And that was just fun. It was so enjoyable. And again, you work for the BBC. I started working in local radio. That happened just through chance, through one of the producers at BBC Radio Manchester, seeing me working at Manchester City. And here I am working for a national radio station, talking to people, putting stuff out on a Saturday afternoon to X amount of people. And you can see by the smile on my face, I'm just enjoying stuff. I never take things too seriously. I like to bring that smile. I like to bring lots of laughter to the work that I do because why not? That's who I am. And I think that's why a lot of people do like the content that I create because I'm smiling, I'm laughing, I'm having a good time. Let's put a smile on your faces as well. And the picture below, you can see, um, I was first invited on to Saturday Social as a guest. And that was back when we were allowed into the studios. And then I got asked to come in and actually present it when Smithy, Adam Smith, wasn't there. So me and Joe Tomlinson on the left of the picture, um, he, um, yeah, we present that programme together when Smithy's not there. And look at us, Chunks and Sharky from Beta Squad. We're just having a laugh on a Saturday morning on the programme before Soccer AM. Now, a little story. I was on my 21st birthday. I was um, invited down to Soccer AM as a Manchester City fan. My cousin had put in the application. We all went down, me and five friends, and we were there. And it was the day that City got beat in the FA Cup by Wigan on my 21st birthday. Um, and I remember, I remember telling um, Helen Chamberlain at the time and Matt Rushton, I'm going to come back and present this programme. 
as a joke, I said, this is what I want to do. I want to present on this program. I want to be the first fan to come back as a fan and do it. Turns out Max Rushton had already been on as a fan and he was presenting on the program. But Saturday Social is the program that goes out just before Soccer AM. So I'm not at Soccer AM just yet, but I was presenting on the program just before it. And again, yeah, Sky Sports. Look at the smile on my face. Look at the smile now I'm talking about it. I just love what I do. So awesome. You, you, some just fantastic experiences there. Um, you mentioned there, you know, you're, you're from Fallowfield, you're from Manchester. Do you feel like, uh, how, how kind of important is that Manchester connection to you? And do, do you feel that when you were doing big stuff for kind of like national publications and international stuff, do you fit, still feel that kind of connection to Manchester and that you're representing Manchester as well? Um, 100%. I'm from here. I still live here. Um, I've always lived in Manchester. Um, and I think that when, when you have voices like mine, when you have faces like mine on national uh, publications on the radio, it's relatable. I think people think of the BBC and they think of this posh voice, they think of this neutral voice. And I get that because it is true. That's what you see on a lot of national things, but it's nice that I get this stage. I don't change the way that I speak, even though my friends in the group chat will tell me that I'm speaking posh and I'm like, <laughs> I'm really not like, I, I'm really not. Um, but yeah, I feel like it is important because it just shows that young people from Manchester can do it. I feel like I, I went to Manchester Academy. So it's actually funny because abs in the picture, we we're in the same year at school. So we actually went to school together and um, yeah, I, I think it's super important because it's a chance to showcase the positives of these areas. It's a chance to showcase what Manchester can do. It's a chance to showcase the fact that actually we have got a voice. This Manchester is a massive city. There's some incredible things happening here. And from a very young age, I've been so, I'm, I, I, I want to show the young people of Manchester. I want to show that if you get an opportunity and yes, you are young, doesn't matter. You can still do it. doesn't matter your age. If you're good at it, you're good at it. You should be getting the opportunities. And I feel like a lot of the time, young people are forgotten about, but there's some incredible young people that are doing some amazing things and they should be showcased more. So true. Uh, one of the things I, I like you kind of talk about here is that there were people in your life that pushed you, helped you by giving you opportunities. You know, we've talked about some of kind of the, the work opportunities you've had. Are there, are there any kind of people personally who have been like a big influence on you who've made you kind of believe that you, you could achieve what you have achieved? Uh, yeah, like my mum is definitely, I think I've been very lucky that uh, no matter what it was, my mum my always supported me. Don't get it twisted. I still had to get a job and pay bills. And when I took the year out, I had to pay some board. I wasn't given a, an easy ride at all, but, I've always been confident in myself and I've always had people around me that have supported those crazy ideas at 15, 16 years old, getting the, the train or the mega bus at times to London for auditions. I was still in school and on a Saturday I was going to London. I was taking the plunge and just getting out there and going. My mum could have said, you're too young. You're not doing that at all. But she understood that it's what I wanted to do and that I was mature and that I could stay safe. She was dropping me off at the bus station at half four in the morning to go and get the bus down to, um, uh, to London, Victoria, is it? At 16 years old. I think about it now and I think, wow, I was doing acting classes and there's been certain things that have kind of happened that you just think they didn't have to do that. People didn't have to support me. I remember being in college. I don't know why this has come back to me now. So I'm 16 years old. I was going to acting classes and it was the day of the month where I had to pay for all of the acting classes. So I can't even remember how much it was. It felt like a million pounds to me. The money went missing. So I, I think somebody stole it, if I'm honest. Um, and the acting coach... He let it off. He said, I understand. And it was just little things like that, where it's that human that he saw how much it meant to me that that's supporting you as well. That's understanding that I can't just find 150 quid from anywhere. I've not just got that. I had teachers at school that always supported me, that pushed me on when I was at, I was the only person on my course that hadn't done GCSE drama. Going back to picking the box, I picked the sport box. But my teacher at the time, 
he really pushed me and said that he believed that that I would be able to still fit into the class. Ended up getting the highest practical ex- um, exam mark that year. And it's, it's not funny because it isn't funny. He passed away that summer between first and second year of, of school, of college. But I always go back to that kind of moment of, wow, like he believed in me and he's no longer here, but that belief still stays with you no matter what. And that was the belief that spurred me on to get into drama school. That was a belief that spurred me on to take opportunities because tomorrow's never promised. And don't get it wrong. I've never had that like, oh, I might die tomorrow kind of attitude, but I just enjoy what I do. And the fact that I get to do it, take every opportunity and have a smile whilst you're doing it. Good stuff. The question we've got on screen there is what, what employers are looking for. And you've obviously you've touched on a, a few things there, particularly about passion and, and hard work, I think are two of the two of the big things I've taken away from what you say. And is there anything else you can kind of uh, add to that in terms of what you think people are looking for for people in the media or broadcasting? Um, I think I put a list together. I'm not sure if there's any other slides. I'm not too sure. But um, what I would say, um, so, I mean, be yourself. That's a massive one. There's no point in being anybody else. I think that employers are looking for you. There's a reason why they've come to you. So give them the best version of yourself. I think that that's kind of super important. They, they want you. Be professional. I learned that at a very young age that, that you can be polite, you can be professional, you can do the job that you're, you've been asked to do and you can do it to a high standard no matter the age that you are. As well, being punctual helps. Um, I can be guilty of that at times. I don't know why. I always find myself being five minutes late, but I always set out extra time. So if I'm five minutes late, I'm still early. Um, But then also being honest, I think that's a massive one with employers. You get the best out of the work when you are honest with each other, when they're honest with you and you've got that working relationship where you can be honest with them. If I don't feel comfortable in any scenarios, if I don't feel comfortable with a piece of work that I'm creating... I have to talk about it because ultimately it's very shallow. It's going to be me that looks bad because it's me that gets put out there. Then you start to think of the repercussions of that. You start to think of the effect it could have on your career. It can start to affect the the well-being. There's no point doing something if you don't enjoy it as well. Um, and I think that that's massive, having that working relationship with an employer, being honest. Don't lie as well. You can... You can say that you can do stuff and that you can learn how to do it, but don't throw yourself completely out of out of your own depths. There's no point in doing that because you will be found out. Do the hard work, do the graft behind the scenes, learn, improve, do that before you get to the job. And then when you get there, something goes wrong. You can handle it because you're not thinking about being yourself. You're not thinking about the work. That's all done. You can then secretly be thinking about everything else. The amount of times I'm live on the radio, especially BBC, so local radio, BBC Radio Manchester, I'm driving the desk, so I know how to do all of that. I'm controlling everything, and things are going wild. Things are going crazy. Me and my co-presenter are in separate studios because of COVID, um, and we're communicating through a glass panel. I'm talking to the producer as a 10-second clip's going out, something major has just broken the news and we're flying high. We don't know how or what is happening, but ultimately we know that the talent is there, the hard work's there, everything's together. So we just have to do it. And when you do that, and when you put that hard work in behind the scenes, no matter what happens, you can just tackle it head on. Nice. I think this is a, this is a great, great list here. Uh, looking at ways to improve, asking for feedback, being yourself using social media to your advantage tell me a bit about that as well like how do you do you feel like you created kind of a social media personality for yourself as well or um how important has social media been in your kind of journey um very important i'd actually say i hate the word influencer i hate it with all of my bones all right but you do have an influence over people and i think i learned very young it's actually quite funny because I remember when Instagram stories became a thing and I was using Snapchat loads and I said, Instagram stories, <laughs> never going to happen. And then I started doing more and more Instagram stories. And then I started taking over people's Instagram. So Manchester City, Puma, I've done stuff for loads of different uh, organizations and companies. And that was just because I like to put my content out there. 
if anyone that's watching has me on Instagram, you'll see that this morning I was out for my morning walk. I'm talking about a funny video that I put on my story. I then um, react to that video, give a bit of me, my experience to it. I just have fun. I just put stupid little funny 15 second videos out there. And people were seeing that. Employers were seeing that. As I said, I got an Instagram DM about doing some work with Adidas. That's huge. With Ilke Gundogan. I know for a fact, because employees have told me that they will have a look at my Instagram. They'll have a look at it. And the shallow aspect is the number of followers. I've not got a massive amount of followers compared to people that I work with at all. But I've got lots of personality on there. People can see from my posts. People can see from my stories. It's almost like a CV. I can show the funny side of things, but I can also show all the work side of things. So, yeah, I'm going to get the picture with Sergio, with Kyle, um, with Tiger Woods, because ultimately I want people to see that I've interviewed these people. The content's there. The links to the content's there. Go and have a look at it jump onto YouTube. I'm putting the link right here. Swipe up, view it. Employers will do that. And I think the the more accessible you make it for employers, the easier it is for them, the more likely they're going to do that as well. You might feel awkward. Your friends and family might go, why are you posting like this? Who cares if it's going to help your... I, I don't ever put relationship stuff or anything to do with me like personal life really on my Instagram because I don't care about other people's why do people care about mine I care about the funny stuff I care about the work that people are doing I care about all of that side of things rather than personal life I can put that on my Facebook if I want to even though I'm not going to so on my Instagram it's me it's the things that I find funny and then people might not like it so what what the, their opinion doesn't matter and it's a lot easier said than done i'm in a position where i'm so comfortable with myself that i can put myself out there on social media but ultimately showcase what makes you you as i put there and i think that is the most important thing you're yourself everyone that's watching this is an individual find what it is that makes you different to everyone else and give the people that reach out to people send them messages as well email people. When I was looking for a new agent, I went through all of the presenters that I value their work. I actually want to be doing similar work to them, find out who their agent was, sent them a tailored email, took so long, but just copying and pasting something. Believe me, I've been caught out before you do mess up. So just don't do it. It takes a lot longer, but send a tailored email to them. People might be going, oh, I know it's long. I know, I know, but just do it because you'll send the wrong name. You'll send the wrong agency name. People have done it to me. I automatically go, well, I'm not, I'm not Dylan. I don't know. Sorry if there's any Dylans watching. Um, I, I'm not Dylan. So that's already annoyed me. You've not took the time to address me by my name. Oh, you just sent it to somebody else. So do I really want to work with you? Eh, no. Be cheeky. I think I get so many different things just by flashing a smile and being a little bit cheeky and asking something. It's how I get around doing multiple jobs in a day is because I say, look, can I come to this a little bit later? Can I do the rehearsal at this time instead? Can I be cheeky and ask you to come, can we go for a coffee? I want to pick your brains about something. Will you listen to my podcast? Be cheeky. What's the worst that they can say? No, you forget about it. Don't be embarrassed. Again, it's a made up um, emotion right there. And then something that I feel like a bit of a hypocrite with this last one. Just get it done. Don't put stuff off. There are things that I've put off. There are things that I'm scared to put out there. I've got a podcast that I've been planning for about six months that is slowly getting there, but I'm just being so meticulous with everything. But sometimes you just got to put it out there, send it to people, get their feedback. I was working on a trailer for this podcast and all the artwork from my friends. I've got so much things done, all the audiograms. And I thought, let me just send it to my agency. What And their feedback was great. I needed that. Don't put it off. Send it to people. Put it out there onto social media. If you've got stuff there, put it out there. Because what what's in five years' time, you're going to look back and go, oh, I wish I would have done that. Just do it. You can always delete it later. Um, so, yeah, that's where I'd say the best places to start. Awesome. Good stuff. 
so we have some time, I think, for some questions. And we've already had a couple that have uh, kind of come through the chat, so I'll put those to you. Uh, anyone else, if you want to ask questions, please either pop them in the chat or you can raise your hand and ask, ask the questions directly to Kyle. Can um, I say as well, just yeah, quickly, ask your questions. I host so many different Q&As. I'm doing loads of work with Barclays and their clients come on. We, I interview footballers, just similar to what we're doing now, go through their careers. The amount of people after the hour that go, I wish I would have asked the question, don't be afraid to ask it. There's a point I always go to. When I was in my second year at drama school, there was a first year that was coming in and they didn't know where to get a unitard. We had to wear them for movement. I've never wore a unitard in my life. I'd only done it at drama school. This guy was coming. He was from South Manchester like me. And I, he was like, I was like, have you got any questions? He came up to me secretly. He was like, oh, like, where do you get like the leotard, like unitard? I was like, that's a great question. You should have asked it because there's three other people who have asked me the same question. Don't be afraid to ask it. You're not the only one thinking about it. So please fire away. 100%. So, uh, I mean, if you want to actually ask the question as well, we've got a couple from uh, Oliver. So Oliver, if you, uh, if you want to maybe ask a question, let me just see if we can... Can Oliver speak? I'm not sure. I'm not sure if we have, <laughs> I'm not sure if we have the technological know, yeah. capabilities to do this. I'm just going to ask his question for now, and we'll see if we can do that perhaps for someone else. So um, one of the questions was, you kind of touched on this a bit. If you hadn't gone down the reporter route, uh, what career path would you have gone down? I mean, you said PE teacher. Uh, the other half of the question, maybe talk a bit more about that. The other part of the question is, would you still like to do acting kind of going forward as well? Um. I think I always wanted to be a PE teacher because it's probably the safe route. I was into sport. I was never good enough to play sport professionally, even though I think I could still make it as a footballer, probably. Um, uh, I can't. I can't make it as a footballer at all. That's why I wanted to do PE teaching. Um, so I... It was the PE teachers that were my inspirations at school. It was always the ones that kind of supported me. Um, so that was why I probably I wanted to be a PE teacher. Will I be able to have survived in that setting? No. I learned very quickly before I left high school, I knew I would probably never be able to do a nine to five because I just wasn't interested in doing that. I don't care about working 18 hours a day. If I enjoy it, am I going to, if I can find a nine to five, I enjoy great. Um, I also never wanted to wear the same things every day. I never wanted someone to tell me what I have to wear. So I never wanted to, have to wear a certain uniform don't know why at 15 I made that decision um but I just never wanted to so I don't think I would have survived long as a PE teacher um acting no I don't have the drive for that anymore um it's something I love I love watching films I love going to the theater when we're allowed I love going to the cinema I love it. All of my friends are still actors. I'm still very close with them all but it's just not something that I'm passionate about. I enjoy having control of certain things and turning down work rather than constantly give me work, give me work, audition, audition. I'm here and I'm in a great position where I can turn down work. So um, that's probably why I wouldn't want to go back into acting. <laughs> Good stuff. Who, who do you think would play you in a film of your life, Kyle? Who would you like to, who would you like to be Kyle Walker? Oh, obviously, Michael B. Jordan. Um, we're both very good looking. Uh, we've got similar abs, uh, arms as well. Or Anthony Joshua. Not decided. What one of the two could do that? I think. I see it. I see. I see the resemblance. Yeah, I can see that. I can see that. Good stuff. Um, so, just one final question here. Uh, it's, it's something a little bit more serious, but important to kind of talk about was um, you said you've been the victim of kind of racial abuse um, through social media. How how do we go about tackling that problem um what i mean it's, it's quite a big issue obviously to put on your, yeah, put on your shoulders no, here but what, what would you what do you think about that about that no it's, a, it's an extremely important issue and we're obviously talking about it a lot more right now with the continued abuse against footballers i think the place to start well social media like twitter uh, their platforms um, instagram they have to be doing more about it I don't think that you should just expect people to shut down their accounts um, in terms of I shouldn't stop going on, on Instagram because somebody else is, is racially abusing me or a footballer. They should have their accounts um, shut down. But again, people need to stop having opinions on how people react to these things. 
if someone wants to take the knee, if someone wants to stand, let them do it however they want to. If someone wants to talk about it, if someone doesn't want to talk about it, stop having an opinion on it. It's not for you to have an opinion. It's not as black and white. One black person going through being racially abused is not the same as another black person being racially abused. It's not the same as anyone being racially abused, no matter what their ethnicity or skin color is. And I feel like sometimes it's very easy for us to just blanket it and put a blanket over it and say, this is how you should respond to it. I don't know how to tackle it. If I did, we'd be talking about it and everyone would do it the same. I know how I can tackle it. I know how I can deal with it myself. But other than that, that is the only way that I can tackle it for myself. We have to join together. We still have loads of work to do. People need to have the conversations. People need to not be afraid to have awkward and difficult conversations. And ultimately, we have to join together and be honest, it is happening. And don't be afraid to say that it's happening and then work together. How can you support other people that are going through this? That's what people should be asking themselves. Good stuff. I think that is um, all we've got time for. But honestly, I can't thank you enough for coming in. Such great insight. Um, and congratulations for everything you're doing. And you're representing Manchester so, so well. And we're all very proud of you. Um, so thank you very much. And uh, yeah, and of course, to all the people watching and listening, um, take Kyle's advice on board. Make sure you contact him on social media. Yeah, no, do. Some advice. So. Genuinely, genuinely, Twitter, Instagram will be easier Drop me a follow, drop me a message. I will get back to you. No, that's a lie. Twitter's easier, all right? Because I'm getting lots of these weird bots on Instagram right now that are filling all of my DMs. Everyone else is probably getting them as well. But drop me a message, Twitter, Instagram. Um, please, it's Kyle Walker 115 um, So just drop me a, um, a message. I will get back to you. Any help you need. If you want to ask a private question, just ask it. Why not? Thank, thank you, you so much. much. Yeah, thank you. This has been a really inspirational uh, session. I've been listening in the background, taking notes. I've had some messages from uh, students that are watching via YouTube and also on Twitter as well, because they're streaming there and they really, really enjoyed it. So thank you so much, Kyle. And thank you, Mark, as our interview extraordinaire. Um, and uh, thank you, guys. So for the next kind of um, hour, it'll be a lunch break and you can chat on Unibuddy. And then we have our PM sessions to start. So we will have a course taster with our media and journalism academic. And then we will have also have an employability session focusing on those virtual interview techniques that we really need to get honed during the pandemic. So I look forward to seeing you this afternoon. And thanks for joining this morning. Bye now.